Welcome to Any Honey and the Newt. We're going to keep exploring love and relationships in basketball, but this time we're moving from the fan perspective to the player perspective. Uh, how many years of NBA uh, uh, basketball playing have you got under your belt there, Anthony? NBA basketball playing? Zero. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, me too. It's uh, So we're going to definitely be talking about something that we don't have firsthand knowledge on. <laughs> I did play against a G League player one time. I got what? utterly decimated. <laughs> um, there's, I've had three instances where I've played against top tier talent. Uh, one, I got to play against the SUNY Albany women's basketball team. Um, and I actually held my own. It was awesome. And because all the players were around my height, I was like the most dominant person on the court. It was pretty spectacular. Um, defensively, I should say. Um, another time I, so the, the G league player I played against, he was actually trying out for the G league team. So he didn't okay. officially make the team, um, but he was really quick. He's the quickest player I've ever played against. And I had to use like literally every ounce of effort that I had just to keep up with him. Wow. And uh, I think I held my own. He still lit me up, but I uh, also lit him up on the other end. So it was a little tip for tat. <laughs> um, and then um, uh, at SUNY, sorry, not SUNY. Um, I visited a friend who was spending the summer in Texas and I got to meet uh, the women's basketball team from Baylor who were the champions that summer or not that summer, that spring. And so I got to shoot around with them. That's awesome. I have not had those brushes with greatness other than playing against somebody who's played against a G league player <laughs> uh, and you. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. No, I, AAU basketball and then I practiced with the varsity team but but ended up not playing with them so I could do theater instead that's the kind of jock I am uh, <laughs> uh so so yeah definitely talking about um players perspectives from what we can tell as observers and fans so I just wanted to give that kind of caveat yeah that's a really interesting point so last time we were talking about you know basically just the one-sidedness of the fan interacting with the game through watching and observing, right? But there's also, um, you know, we talked a lot last season about narrative structure. And we kind of touched on like this, uh, this deeper level of understanding of the game through learning about the players and their lives, right? And I think we even very briefly mentioned the possibility of like the duties players have to the game because of the fan interaction. Um, but I don't think we got very deep into that. So before, I guess, uh, you know, as like an uh, intro to this topic, is there anything that um, that you want to use to build off of from maybe that first conversation? Well, I think we were definitely um, talking about fans of teams and fans of players. And uh, it's, in both of those cases, the, even the fans of teams seem to focus on players, right? Like we want superstars. We have the main guys that we follow and we can kind of plug and play the role players as needed. And sometimes people uh, will, will find a particular role player that they enjoy their game or, or find some kind of fondness for. Um, I, re I remember, um, oh, I was going to say, I remember, but obviously I don't cause I'm blanking on his name, but a, a redheaded uh, three point shooter that I had never it's not it's not uh, Bonner, um, but anyway, some some player I'd never seen play, and then I found out he'd been in the league seven years, and his whole job was like come out for five minutes and try and hit three threes, and then go back to the bench. And I just was fascinated with that whole. That's his career. Like he's he gets paid to do that, and that's pretty fascinating. So anyway, I think a lot of uh, fandom, whether it's for team for the sport or whatever, still tends to be player centric, and I wonder what that's like for a player who dreamed of playing the sport professionally for maybe a couple of reasons one uh, financially right like it's a great way to make a lot of money really quick and, and young while you're young 
um, just loving the sport and being talented at it probably motivates you to excel at it and beat everybody else. So the competitive nature of the sport might propel you to the game. Uh, maybe you choose basketball over other sports because there's something about that game that you particularly enjoy. Uh, and then there's also like the possibility of like ce- celebrity and and um, being a fan favorite. Like maybe that drives some some players. And so there is at least one of the motivations uh, and relationships that could be central for a NBA player is the fan player relation. You sort of mentioned this um, when you talked about the financial aspect of it, but for some people, it's actually a way to change their social structure, like where, their placement in social structure, right? Like um, a given example, like Stefan Marbury grew up in the projects in Brooklyn, Staten Island, right? And so for him and his family, basketball was a chance to get out of the, you know, the perpetual economic situation that, that them and all the people that were living in their complex were in. And I don't think it's as strong a narrative now, but there was like a period of time in like the, the nineties, two thousands where a lot of players were coming from really uh, poverty stricken situations and, you know, using the financial incentive as a way to escape, you know, their, their situation. Yeah, I don't. I don't have anything to add to that. That's, it's a, a fact. Um, it's probably reveals a lot of things about society. The fact that um, we are willing to pay so much money for our entertainment and for leisure that this ends up being one of the only routes that that certain people are allowed to take. Um, you know, there's other justice concerns about education and and skill development. So maybe maybe I'll set all that to the side. Yeah. Um, one other thing that I wanted to add was uh, we kind of talked about this in the last episode with the, the fans becoming invested in the players. Um, but as you just mentioned, there's a lot of different reasons why players are invested in the NBA, right? They either, sometimes they want to play for a specific franchise. They're hoping to get drafted by that franchise. Uh, example is RJ Barrett getting drafted by the Knicks. Um, or, you know, whichever rookie gets drafted to their hometown team, essentially. Derek Rose to Chicago is another great example of that. Um, so there's like that incentive. There's also just the incentive of just trying to be better. One of my favorite things about anime storytelling is like the protagonist is always trying to be the best at whatever it is that they're doing. And in basketball, right, you get these few who, who really want to rise to the top. You know, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, uh, Giannis, they all have this incredible thirst to be the greatest. And it's like watching this arms race, but it's really interesting and and to watch and entertaining. Yeah. What's really fascinating about this, too, like there's so many um, debates about intergenerational comparisons. But one of the things that makes that such a challenging debate is that the newer generations learn from those that went before, right? Pete, Pete Maravich's underhanded uh, floaters and and behind the back passes were were revolutionary. But now, who can't shoot a floater and and pass behind the back? Like, it's a skill that every player has to have if they're going to play professionally. Similarly, Jordan, um, you know, his leaping ability and acrobat acrobatic dunks and layups kind of inspired generations to mimic him. And so not everybody can jump like Mike, uh, but a lot of people have learned from that to, to learn how to use the backboard and the rim to make nice finishes. Uh, they've learned how to take physical contact and turn that into a playable finish. And so as each generation learns from the greats before them, the average rises, right? Like the, the competition level overall is higher and harder to excel at. So we can see someone like Vince Carter, who has leaping abilities, amazing, is going to go down as one of the greatest dunkers of all time, and uh, was probably never considered a top 10 player of the league. Like he was maybe close, but uh, he's never going to be considered the greatest player in the league. But his skill level compared to the greats of the 70s is just, the, the comparison isn't fair, right? And so I throw all that out there to say, like, as as players love the game and they learn the game from those that went before, uh, we will continue to see 
wider widespread kind of development we see kids learning euro you know you and i were playing one day when some kids were practicing the euro step and that's something i still can't do (laughs) (laughs) i also think of that day we were playing and everybody we were playing with were just launching threes and i'm like damn it steph curry this is all your fault (laughs) so i just say that love of the game um probably has something to do with the sport itself but it it entails a little bit of learning the history of the game and what's gone before you and and you're going to inspire the next generation so there's something there for players that even at an average level that want to be great they they still have an opportunity to inspire yeah for sure so in uh in this concept of love of the game are there any players that you would say kind of embody that idea players right now Mm, that's good. I was definitely going to go back to the past. So give me a second. Do you have any on your mind while I think about your question? Yeah, sure. Uh, going back to the past, uh, who would you say embody that? Was there anybody that came to the top? Yeah. Yeah. It's the inventive players like Steve Nash comes to mind. Um, I definitely think, I mean, Jordan and LeBron stand out as obvious ones. So I'm trying to think of other players, but uh, innovators, people that, that wanted to see uh, try something new in the game and extend the rules. Um, uh, like, oh, I, as soon as I try to say a name, it like blinks out on me. So <laughs> no worries. Um, and I would, I think I agree mostly with that. But I would say sometimes, um, for some people, their drive is so much that I would argue that they probably don't even love the game that much anymore. They're just obsessed with winning. Um, an example of that is like Michael Jordan. Um, he, I, I I think that he loved the game, right? But he didn't love it enough to stay with it. He retired to play baseball because he wanted to honor his dad. And, uh, I think there were some stories that came out that, you know, basketball wasn't even really his first love. He just was really good at it. So, which is why he like eventually quit baseball and came back to basketball. Hmm. Um, a player who he's actually sort of retired now, but I think he's trying to get back in who comes to mind immediately is Jamal Crawford. Uh, and the reason why I say like, here's my, here's my evidence that he does love the game is one. He's like 40 years old. He's still playing Vince Carter. I would put in this category too. Um, his ball handling was groundbreaking at, at that time, he didn't start playing basketball until I think his junior year of high school, like mm. in, in any organized way. So he just has this like natural talent that allowed him to exceed. He got drafted, I think his sophomore year of college. So he had like four organized years of basketball and went to play in the NBA, which is astounding. Yeah. Um, he excelled. And then he started doing all this community service stuff around basketball as well. So now he's also known as like one of the best community service people in the NBA, Uh, but he has this thing called the Jamal Crawford classic. I want to say where he runs a league out of Seattle and most of his like Seattle basketball brethren come to play in the league, but there's a lot of people in the NBA who do it. Um, So they have this like summer league every year uh, and it goes back at least as far as like his fourth season in the NBA. So this is like 15 years ago. So not only does he play basketball professionally every season, but he also plays in the summer for charity. Um, Always trying to expand his game. Doesn't matter what team he's traded to. He's always known as like the most consummate professional on every single team he's played on. And I think like to me that really embodies love of the game. Nice. That's good. And I, I started realizing like I would be almost nervous to name names as if the people we excluded obviously don't love the game. And and it really takes a lot to say that a, a person who's willing to dedicate so much time to working out, to practice, to competing at that level, um, to say that they don't love the game, it's, it's kind of a really bad insult. <laughs> like I'm a little nervous to, to make that I thing. Think... I think there are people that we would say they don't put in the effort and it shows right but other than that i think i would i would say it's like um some people can love the game more than others and i don't think saying that somebody doesn't love the game is i don't think it's that's like a death knell or anything right like you go to some people go to work 
and they do their job. That doesn't mean that they don't like what they're doing, but they don't have to really love it. And maybe there's some days that they don't love it. Um, so like an example is um, Tracy McGrady, right? I'm not going to say whether he does love the game or not, but I remember hearing stories from Jeff Van Gundy, from other coaches he's had, where the game is so effortless to him that he doesn't put in the work necessary to be you know, the best player in the league. And maybe, you know, he didn't really feel the need to. And that's kind of fine. And maybe he does love the game. I mean, now he's like doing commentating uh, for games. He works with ESPN, I think. Um, so he clearly does love the game in some capacity enough to stay with it, right? Or maybe he loves the money so much that he doesn't really care about the love. He's doing, he's just, just a job for him. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, if I were to try and name names now, Dwayne Wade is a recent past. Dirk Nowitzki, I think those guys represented that love of the game. I think people that have stuck with it late into their years and been willing to accept the bench role demonstrates that kind of love. I'm thinking of Paul Gasol and Rudy Gay. Like these, these people seem to really be willing to make sacrifices to continue to play the game. But when you talk about young players, I think they're still um, in the early stages of that love, right? Like it's really a beautiful thing. And so it's it's easy to see the passion of young players continuing to grow and wanting to be out on the floor and, and fighting for more time. So so it'd be harder to just name a couple of names when I think a lot of players fit that bill. I guess the this leads to the question, um, what is love? What does love of the game mean? Right. Like, I think everybody would agree that when you have love for something, there are different levels of that love. Right. Like, um, I love basketball. I love reading about the NBA, but I don't think I love it enough to want to spend, you know, 10 hours a day watching game film to make a couple of highlight videos. Yeah. Uh, good. So, uh, introducing a little bit of philosophy and challenging some of the conceptual definitions that we might have uh love is a single english word right but we might have different concepts that we use it for if i say i love ice cream i love to play basketball and i love uh my mother do i mean the same thing by all three uses of that term is your mother so, made of ice cream <laughs> and she plays basketball it's Whoa. the trifecta, it's a trifecta. Yeah. the holy grail <laughs> So, so I do want to just kind of say we probably can allow for there to be multiple conceptions of love without being inconsistent. Um, it's helpful maybe to parse those and what we mean in each stage. So let's just focus on love for the game and what kind of love that might mean. But one kind of sub-concept that I think is um, available to most of those notions of love is commitment. If, you, if you're willing to commit time and energy to something that's that's an expression of of love uh there might be more to that than just commitment i don't think commitment spells everything out but but that certainly seems to be a core component so um commitment's an interesting one right because you could you could really push the button here really push on it um if you just say something like anybody who watches or anybody who's ever picked up a basketball has some extent of love for the game, right? That's like, I'm going all the way to the minimum extreme of commitment, right? Maybe they have to have done it a few times to, to be at that minimum level, right? Like if you watch the, the playoffs, I, I don't think they would characterize themselves as having love for the game, um, but that's probably like the minimum level of like starting to build that commitment for the game. Does that make sense? It does. Let's add to that notion of commit, commitment then something like desire, uh, because I've known, you know, I used to teach high school and, and PE classes, and there were a lot of kids that, that had to do what I told them to do, and they didn't love it. <laughs> right? So they picked up the basketball, they played the game because that was the activity for the hour, and they, they did not do not have a love for the game. Yeah, okay, that's good. So then you add desire to the fold. Um, because the reason why I went all the way down that minimal bear, uh, rabbit hole was because I started thinking about, you could probably say everybody who's in the NBA has some love for the game, no matter where they're at with that love, 
right? Because they've committed themselves to get to this point. Um, yeah. And they're, you know, adding desire to it actually articulates that a little bit better. They had desire to get to that point as well. Um, and then I went backwards, college players, same thing, high school players, same thing. So there has to be some level of desire to even get to, I would say, like the high school level of, you know, varsity, junior varsity playing. Yeah. And, and to play at that competitive level does require some, I'll say sacrifice. You may enjoy doing it. So it may not feel like a sacrifice, but you have to give time to that activity and not something else. Right. I, when I was interested in playing for the high school uh, varsity team, I started running every day and I hated running. (laughs) Right. But I needed, I knew I needed to get in, uh, needed to gain better conditioning. And so um, that's something that to pursue a goal that I cared about, I was willing to make a sacrifice. So there's something like that. What's interesting um, as you go through the different levels backwards, I want to go back up to NBA and, and everybody that has ever made it to the NBA at some point loved the game of basketball. And what might be a curious question is instead of questioning each player's love of the game is maybe focusing on, are they still in the desire stage? Or are they transitioning over to like primarily commitment? Like this is what I've dedicated my life to and I'm going to keep trying to do my best at this sport, even though maybe I don't have the same desire I did when it was, when I was younger and it was fresh and not as difficult. That's um, a really interesting thought. And I want to just ask you a clarifying question. Uh, So you talk about commitment, right? And there's also to me on the other side of commitment is investment. Mm -hmm. right like you've invested all this time and effort to becoming good at basketball um and for some people maybe commitment is like an expression of the investment is like well i've already got all the skill i basically should stick with it Uh, there's a a logical fallacy that or a, a bias that we have as humans which is um uh what's the name of it it's the sunk investment the, fallacy. thank you thank you the sunk cost fallacy where like i've done all of this work in it and even if it's not paying out for me because i did all this work in it i should stick with it um and i feel like we do we even see that on the professional level you know guys who they're just not enjoying the game anymore you hear when they get traded from one team to another it was like i really wasn't enjoying basketball anymore i didn't love it anymore um and i needed to find something that would make me re recommitted to the the sport and like this is kind Mm -hmm. of a fresh start for me yeah yeah i think that's right uh there and it's a good distinction that you're making between investment and commitment there are probably people who late in their careers are merely invested and others who are committed and invested um so that's a, a good distinction that might help us see why we can sense that some players are are more engaged with trying to excel to the next level i want to just ask uh or open the door to thinking about the player's relationship with fans uh and especially in relation to this love for the game i feel like whether or not a player expresses love for the game is a a criteria criterion by which a lot of fans will judge them and we've seen different players like become heels to use your wrestling analogy uh, because they didn't satisfy some kind of fan storyline or desire. So what is the, do you want to talk a little bit about the player fan relationship and maybe whether the players owe fans anything? Yeah, that's such a great question. I think we as fans unfairly judge players for their love of the game, right? Like when you are elite at something, it's almost like this, at some point it kind of becomes a burden. You talk about sacrifice, right? Like for them, they've sacrificed a lot to get here, but now they have to continue to sacrifice to their own detriment uh, in some cases. I'm not going to say all cases. Um, and one thing that really opened my eyes to players, how players like exist in the world of basketball was this like, you know, kind of learning about what they do in their spare time. Um, this is like how deep the Knicks fandom went was like, I would follow them on social media, learn about like their hobbies, um, you know, what made them tick, uh, what makes them laugh, what makes them cry, that kind of stuff. And then I learned that like, we place all of this unfair judgment on players because of, because we have this, 
I don't I don't want to say superficial love of the game, but we have this other kind of love of the game. Like it's deeper, it's different. Sorry, not deeper. It's different from the players' love of the game because they're playing the game and we're watching the game. And um, you know, thinking about like player development was a perfect example of that. It's like this guy got drafted number one overall. I'll say Mark. I'll just throw Markel Fultz in there. First round, you know, first number one draft pick got injured halfway through his rookie season. Um, kind of criticized. And it felt unfair to judge him because of, you know, whatever issues the Philadelphia development staff had, right? You could easily look at all of their draft picks. They were like bottom team, so they had all these, you know, one through five, six, ten draft picks. And only like three of them panned out at the time. Like Ben, you could say Ben Simmons was a good choice. Uh, You could say Joel Embiid was a good choice. Um, and, uh, what's the dude who plays on Minnesota now? He was like a lanky European. Um, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. And you could say he was, he like really fit in with their philosophy. Um, Nerland's Noel, I would also say kind of excelled, but, um, he got eventually got traded really quickly and Sarge got traded too, but those are the two guys who stuck around and everybody else got measured up to their success. Now, first you easily say like, everybody's different, right? So even if they were the best in their class at that time, it's not fair to compare them to anybody else because everybody learns differently. And I would not have known that or even thought about, I shouldn't say didn't know, but I wouldn't have thought about that if I didn't take the time to get to know the players as people, because I think it's very easy for us as fans to just say that these, these people in this TV window are robots doing our bidding for our enjoyment, like gladiators in a coliseum. Yeah. And Draymond Green's been uh, become pretty famous for being a a cantankerous kind of, when he does his interviews, he's more likely than not going to say something that will rile up some fans, either get, get the Warriors fans excited and, and uh, rowdy (laughs) or, or rile up uh, opposing fans. Um, But he's famous for kind of like pointing out, how all these people who don't play basketball and don't play the game have opinions <laughs> and he doesn't really care about their opinions because they don't know what's happening on the court in the locker room. Like just the, the experience of that he indicates is um, different than what we all expect. And so we shouldn't presume to be able to to speak to that situation without having firsthand experience, which is an interesting, I don't know if I completely agree with it, but it's an interesting point. Yeah. One other thing that I would throw into this, you mentioned expectations, um, there's like the expectations the players have of themselves or the expectations that we have of the players. And I would also throw in, um, oh man, it's fleeting now. These words are fleeting through, <laughs> through the Dude. air. Um, there's not just expectations, there's values that we have, right? As you know, we have societal values and norms as you, you always like to, to poke my buttons on reminding me um but there's also individual values that we have right so i value learning so when i see a player learning i care more about that player uh whereas others value excellence right so they of course are going to gravitate to the top of the nba pack and anybody who doesn't have that same standard of excellence they care less about or i shouldn't say care less about it maybe they scrutinize more because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, they hold them to that standard, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's another way that we as fans are sort of unfair in this player-fan relationship. right? Players, they have player-player relationships, which we'll talk into about in another episode. They have all these other kinds of relationships that they deal with. Um, I feel like they do actually care about um, the player-fan relationship, um, but probably in a... Like when you have enough negative experience with that relationship, I think that they are more prone to, to kind of toss it aside. I think of um, Kevin Durant, who's a perfect example of this. Like his first seven or so years with the Thunder, he was a very heavy fan favorite. Um, and then, you know, the media. I think maybe the media of player relationship is one that we haven't talked about, and I, I don't know if we will. But the media kind of started coming out with these articles 
essentially writing about dissent between him and Russell Westbrook while they're on the same team. Um, and then the Kevin Durant burner account was discovered. Right. Was that, was that in OKC? I think that was in. Yeah, Trump's it was, it was the last year he was in OKC. I only know that cause I was okay. just reading about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so then the, the Kevin Durant burner account came about, which essentially destroyed his relationship with Russell Westbrook, um, but at the same time destroyed his relationship with the fans. And then he kind of did this heel turn where, at least in the public persona, right, he was this good guy. He was the anti-LeBron up until this point. You know, it seemed like he really appreciated the fans' input and he cared about the fans' input. Um, and then after this this discovery was made, after all that turmoil between him and Westbrook, after the turmoil of him wanting to go to the Warriors, he became a heel in pro wrestling terms. And and he, you know, now people chastise him for his decisions. And he kind of like, every, you know, response he has is like, go F yourself or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's a big example of the fan relationship souring and and um the one of the player response one of the player responses that's available right is just like well screw the fan that's not why I'm here. Um another one would be to like try and curry favor with the fans and figure out a way to to restore a reputation. I I don't know. I don't have an example right off the plate but maybe Dwight Howard is close to that. Um mm-hmm. But there, you know, there's different ways that players might see fans and relate to them, and I don't, I wouldn't characterize it as players loving fans. I, I definitely think that they feel like interacting with the public is a burden that they have to. Um, that's part of the role that they've got in their in this professional position of of entertainment um, and basketball. But uh, some people seem to cherish the celebrity and the. Uh, like Shaq seems like definitely like he's going to be on camera for the rest of his life. doesn't matter what he's doing. Right? Some people want to be in the spotlight and, and engage with the public and other people want to be left alone and, and really just do not care to engage that. And, and really it is just a job for them to, to engage the public. Maybe the player re- fan relationship is more of a meta layer. Um, Cause I think like you said, some people were really, appreciate the celebrity status given to them because of fandom. Yeah. So kind of contrasting with Shaq style, Charles Barkley was like hated while he was a player because he basically just didn't give a crap about the fans. Cause he, he cared about winning on the court. Right. So everything he did was about that. Um, and then he became this mouthpiece for TNT and it seems like he's embraced the fandom perspective, the celebrity part of it. Right. He, he still says like outrageous things, but it definitely feels more like a character that like an exaggeration of himself or some, some sort of character that he's portraying than, than, you know, this hard lined, you know, very hard philosophical person on the court that he was, I should say. What do you have to say about uh, Charles Barkley? He's, he's a long ways from the, I'm not a role model. (laughs) Yes. Thank you. Uh, I mean, I couldn't remember the quote. (laughs) So there was even antagonism about like, well, I don't care what fans think of my personal life. It's I'm living my life the way I want. Um, and I'm not somebody that has to set an example for other people. It's their choice if they want to pay attention to what I do or not. Um, and I still think he kind of feels that kind of independence, but he, a lot more sensitive. I, I've noticed in his commentary on TNT, he's a little bit more conscientious about how people might take things he says and even though he does say the outlandish things and says pretty brash things, he will walk things back if he feels like he needs to or, or clarify them. Yeah. And that's kind of why I was thinking that the fan relationship, at least from the player's perspective is more like a a meta thing. Like they acknowledge and appreciate that the fans give them the platform and give them the, the money, right? Essentially like our viewership is what pays their salaries. Um, but they still feel autonomy in their decision making, despite that you know possible perception of owing. I think there's an interesting dynamic too. Uh, you mentioned in the previous episode about fans how you started like learning about players' personal lives and 
reading their Twitters and, and finding out about their, um, like where they want to live and what their aspirations were and their background and how that helped you to come appreciate the game and the player more. But that is quite a lot of exposure, right? Like somebody who chooses to play basketball, all of a sudden their personal life is up and available for everybody to, to explore. And I suspect that what we're experiencing right now is, is maybe a little bit of a backlash as social media, as pervasive media and nonstop podcasting and, and access has been made available so that fans can get to know players on a more personal level. There's probably a, a lot of players that are saying, hey, I understand that we have to have fans, but I'm a little uncomfortable with how invasive this is to me living my life. And so I can see maybe some of the the heels of the NBA being just people saying, I'm exhausted by this. I don't I don't want to have to deal with this and put up with the emotional energy of placating people I don't know, <laughs> strangers whose opinions don't matter to me. Right. And so um, I can kind of see from the player perspective how it's annoying that they're that entertaining the fans and engaging with the fans off the court is part of their job now. Like that's got to be frustrating. Yeah. One thing that's uh, as you were talking about that, I just kept thinking like, man, celebrities in Hollywood have been dealing with this for like 50, 60 years. Um, How do they deal with the exposure and how do the you know it'd be nice to compare that to how NBA players deal with that exposure because the NBA wasn't massively popular and by massive I mean like um, it ha- didn't have as broad of an audience as it does today until about the mid '90s, the late '90s, and so you know celebrityism is pretty new for for the NBA as a whole. And, you know, this generation of players are definitely experiencing uh, the full gamut of, you know, celebrity compared to like, you know, maybe Jordan and Hakeem and Patrick Ewing had that level in the, you know, in the early 90s. It's interesting how some players have used that platform and opportunity to affect their on-court persona too, right? Joel Embiid has become famous for for like um roasting people on his twitter and and putting out all these memes and just trying to be funny and engage the audience but now like on the court he does things that are meme worthy even and uses taunts from his twitter on the court and and vice versa like he's kind of bleeding those through whereas other players like you've mentioned kevin durant Kawhi leonard like they're more reserved and kind of don't want to engage the the social media let me just play the game let's keep them in their separate spheres kind of thing right i wouldn't be surprised if player if there's a few players who like joel and bead have kind of embraced the role that relationship and they're essentially playing a character towards the fans like if i was a player for sure there'd be like some glimpses of my real life but i probably would have more fun with the character aspect of it and it would probably allow me to shield myself from the fans in like a different way. Like if I can play a character, then the fans are getting what they want, but they're not getting what they're getting what I want them to want instead. Yeah, that's the next meta level. <laughs> so uh, we talked about the fan player relation, player love of the game. Uh, we're going to shift gears and in another episode, talk about organizations and the relationships um, among within organizations and with from organizations to their fans. Uh, so maybe we'll leave the player relationship to management uh, for, for that episode. Anything else you want to add about players before we sign off? I think I'm good. Don't hate the right. player, hate the game, right? <laughs> don't eat the game <laughs> you can be a casual fan don't worry about it <laughs> don't worry about it yeah <laughs> all right well thanks for joining us for another episode of anybody in the